Chris Watts polygraphic test. I gotta find him, right? I need your help. When we find the guy who took him, what do you think we should do? This is what is known as a behavior-provoking question. An innocent person will usually give what is known as a draconian response. They will immediately respond with the harshest sentence possible for the crime they are falsely being accused of committing. A deceptive individual will often give an equivocating response. This means that they will fragmentize and divert from the question to a certain degree as a means to avoid responding to the query in its entirety. They're gonna come home safe, correct? When you find the guy. When we find the guy, they're going to come home. Life in prison would be the, that's what I would, that's what I would think with two kids that are involved. What if he hurt them? Did they pop, did, did I, I'm not sure if like that penalty is even, Use, is it used in Colorado? I'm not even sure what is the death penalty. Okay. Um, I mean, like, if these kids are not alive, like, there's no, there's nothing you could do to, to cope with that, to make me cope with that, if those kids are not okay. Can can we keep talking about some complicated things? Sure. Some things that are going to make you uncomfortable. No, that's fine. Okay. You've done very good in talking to me about this really hard conversation you guys had, okay? Very good. That's sometimes hard. And I understand why sometimes someone in your position says, uh, doesn't want to tell me about that. Because please go help me find my kids and you don't need to know about my, my marriage argument, okay? So I gotta say, you've done very good at that. Um, and I need you to keep doing that. So I need to ask you about um, your marriage and uh, infidelity. Okay. Okay. Tell me about it. Yeah, I have never cheated on my wife. Okay. And I fully suspect she has never done that to me. Oh, okay. The interrogator was already aware that Chris was cheating on his wife with a woman by the name of Nicole Kessinger. He had handed over his phone earlier on this interview for what he thought was for the purpose of going through his and his wife's mutual contacts to look for potential suspects. Judging by Chris's bold-faced denial, it's safe to assume he deleted all of his correspondence with Nicole beforehand, yet he was most likely unaware that the FBI have programs that can recover every single piece of digital exchange sent from a device even long after it's deleted. Highly trained investigator over here, right? I see pictures of you from a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I see you standing before me now. Okay, uh -huh. okay. you've gotten pretty fit. Yes. Okay. You can imagine when guys start cheating or want to cheat, that's what happens. Yes. So tell me about it. So I did not cheat on my wife. Okay. What do I do to help you walk out of this room and not look like the person who's responsible? You have to trust me. I had nothing to do with these, with this, with this act of like evil cruelty, whatever has happened here. Because my love for these two girls and my wife, like I don't want anything to happen to them. I've never wanted anything to happen to them. No matter if me and my wife separate or not, or divorce or anything, I never wish harm on anybody, on a human being in general. Okay. Like just seeing that picture, like. I need them, I, I want them just to run through that front door and just grab me, mm -hmm. or just bear, just tackle me, knock me to the floor, bust my head up, I don't care. The amount of love I have for my family is exponential, and I, it's never going to die. Okay. And they need, I want them back. Okay. I have to have them back. When you walk out of this room, there's nothing I can say to a room full of police officers that's going to convince them that you have nothing to do with this. I know. You know what they think. I, I know what all that all the yeah. Here's a guy who didn't call 911, who woke his wife, wife up at a ridiculous hour because he was so guilty about something that he had to get it off his chest and say, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving you. That didn't go well. Okay, so what happened? She told me she wanted me to wake her up before I left. That's 
why I didn't just wake her up, like, just to tell her this. Like, I woke her up. That's what she wanted to do, and we talked. Like, usually at 4 a.m., I wake up, I go down and work out. This day, I wanted to talk to her about this. I love these girls. I love these girls so much. And this picture right here, Celeste and Bella, those are my life. I am helped make those kids. There's nothing in my life that means more to me than these kids. Nothing. Kids, that's, that's your life. That's your lifeline. That's everything. Like, you make kids, they come first before anything. Kids, spouse, family. That's what it's always been. Nothing you've told me tonight makes sense. Nothing you've told me tonight feels like the truth. Can we start over? Sure. Tonight's been pretty intense, I can imagine. How are you feeling? <laughs> I've, I've slept like two hours last night, so I'm like running on empty right now. But I know, I can see it. So why don't I do this? I'm sure you don't mind if we take a break for the night. Um, and I'm sure that you are um, feeling some of the pressure from me. Okay. I'm going to commit to you that we're not going to stop working until we find them. Okay. Okay. And I want to commit to you that there is going to come a time when you're going to feel this pressure from other people. I'm not the only one who thinks that there's a possibility you have something to do with this. Like another FBI agent, like pressure, or like this, like everyone. Okay, everyone, Chris. Okay. The interrogator is clearly receptive to Chris's anxiety and endeavors to amplify this emotion before ending the interview. He wants to inflate Chris's apprehension as much as possible for the looming polygraph test that approaches the following day. Tonight, when you go home, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to pass out because you're so tired. Okay, and that's probably not going to be what happens. Your head's going to go race. Okay, so tonight when you lay down and your head starts racing, there's going to be things that come to your mind, okay? This always happens, always. It's very natural. You're going to say, I wonder why he asked me that, okay? You're going to say, screw him. How dare he accuse me, okay? You're going to say, I wonder if they thought of this, okay? And then you're going to say, I probably should have told him something or this or that, okay? Those are the most common things. Um, when those thoughts come to your head, I want you to call me. And those are beautiful kids. Those kids have a good dad. And I know it. You should see the picture of someone for them. Yeah. It's a better one. But it's just... I'm sorry, too. But it's those kids have a good dad. The following discourse from the officer could be construed as the reframing technique, where an interrogator will try and shift the suspect's view of themselves from negative to positive as a means to lightening the iniquity of their crimes and increasing the chances of a confession. However, this is more likely what is known as passive accusation, where the interrogator is almost certain of the suspect's guilt and indirectly accuses and in some manner indignifies the suspect. This is made evident by the high praises the officer gives to Chris for extremely trivial deeds. A lot of dads don't get second pairs of clothes and cook eggs and give them snacks at night. You know, a lot of, a lot of men, that's a woman for it, right? I don't like to get involved. But you're not that kind of guy. Okay. So can we say that tomorrow at 11 o'clock? Sure. We can do a polygraph? Sure. Here. Um, I appreciate you coming in tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. Give me a few minutes. Um, this is Tammy. Did you meet Tammy yesterday? No, I'm good. All right, so are you? Okay. So are you? Is it on this? Yep, I know. It's, I'll explain what that is here in a little bit, yeah. but you don't have to worry. It, it's not on or anything right now. It's not gonna. It's not gonna buzz you or anything. <laughs> Obviously, you're probably nervous about taking today's test. Honestly, I would think something is wrong with you if you weren't nervous about coming mm -hmm. in here to take a polygraph. Yeah. Even if people are like, I don't have anything to hide. It is nerve-wracking. Oh, and yeah. I have taken tons of polygraphs. Obviously, in my training. 
Um, I went to 10 weeks for training. I've been a polygrapher about, for about five years. Um, I went to the best school in the country. So I want you to have confidence in the fact that if you had nothing to do with this disappearance, like we're going to find that out today. Okay. I have the best training that they offer in the United States. Um, I, we use the most validated testing. Um, that no way I'm going to ask you the question. So believe me, if you had nothing to do with this, I will be able to show them that today. This is psychological pressure disguised as reassurance. It's not a routine procedure during the pretest phase of a polygraph exam, yet this technique will be used when the suspect's guilt is almost conclusive. Polygraphs are not a foolproof system, and they can be beaten, but with a heightened state of anxiety, it becomes considerably more challenging and unlikely. On this occasion, the polygrapher distinctly applies this technique for maximal effect. There's actually only two ways you can fail a polygraph, okay? The first way would be if you fail to follow my instructions, I'm going to give you a lot of instructions today about how to sit still, how to answer questions, things like that. So if you fail to follow those instructions, you will not pass today's test, okay? Right. The second way would be if you choose to lie to me today. You know, if you did have something to do with their disappearance, um, it would be really stupid for you to come in and take a polygraph today, right? Like, it would be really dumb. Like, you should not be here right now sitting in this chair if you had anything to do with Shanann and the little girl's disappearance, okay? Well, yeah, we just, everything flourished from there. Like in 2011, I, pr I proposed to her over in Ocean Isle Beach. And, it was, <laughs> and she was just sitting there crying with a little eviction notice. And she had, she, had, she recorded it. It was really, it was an amazing day to see that. And then she left. She was, she was, I was there. Like she had a midwife for this one. So like they actually had me like, oh, you can stand here and like, you know, catch her and like, but, but left came out like so fast that like I barely had a chance to go like this and they moved me out of the way because she just like came out. The polygrapher will also obtain the examinee's version of the facts regarding the specific issues under investigation. Like, I was just hoping that I would get that knock on the door or a phone call or a text. I mean her phone, I mean, they have her phone like hopefully maybe it's a number I don't know. Hopefully it's like you know like a burner, a burner phone or some, some kind of, some kind of like phone she bought and she could just text me and call me like, hey, I'm okay, something, or just get a knock on the door and then the kids just run in. I miss like the kids like sitting at the dinner table and like having to tell them to eat their dinner and like I miss them throwing their chicken nuggets at me, like I was, I just want to find them. I want them to come home safe, like wherever they are, I hope they are safe and I really, I really hope they can just come home. It makes me feel like, all right, maybe somebody has her that's not that's not keeping her safe or something terrible has happened and that is that's the nightmare and what would that terrible thing be that somebody hurt them chris recounts a brief summary of the events and states multiple vague possibilities for his family's disappearance the polygrapher then starts to elect specific timelines for chris to give his account on um you said the next thing you know is her getting into bed with you, is that right? I could not felt her getting into bed. We didn't say anything because I just, I just kind of felt it. Okay. Do you know if she was on her phone or like how any of that works? I don't, I don't think she was on her phone. Was she mad at all? I mean, being crying, crying like she was, crying like I was, I mean, yeah, I mean, she was upset. But I mean, it was, it was, it comes with that kind of conversation. In the next moments, you will see another subterfuge of psychological pressure, this time disguised as routine questioning procedure. I know it's totally awful to think about, but what are ways, because I need to make sure that you know what I'm talking about, what are ways that you can make someone disappear? I mean, like, if you're talking about, like, what I've seen, like, on the movies, or, like, how, you, like, how people, uh, if you read about other people, I mean, you hire somebody like a hitman yeah i mean that's i mean yeah. i'm just being honest no but that's what i want that's what i want because i want you to go through all of these scenarios in your head because i want you to know for sure what i'm talking about when i say that you know asking you if you physically caused her disappearance okay like like you'd hire somebody or you have a somebody you know that that would do it i mean it's like i don't I mean, it's hard. And, it's a hard and question to answer. And I know this stuff. It's a hard question to answer. Right. Because uh, I didn't, I had nothing to do with this disappearance. Right. But like, I don't even want to think about like, 
if, I, if if you're asking like how I would do it, like no I anyone, like anyone how would how it. would anyone cause someone else's disappearance? I mean, you would. Like you because of someone's disappearance by murdering them. Would yes. you agree with that? Yes. So what different physical ways could you cause someone's disappearance through murder? You could stab someone, Stab right? someone, shoot someone, hit them with a blunt object. Um, what else is there? I mean, I use a weapon like a gun or a knife. I mean, okay. you could... Smother someone. Smother someone. Strangle um, someone. Hang someone. I mean, yeah, you can. All that kind of things. I mean, it's hard to even think about that kind of stuff right now. Mm -hmm. So you could strangle someone. You could drown someone. Yeah. You could shock someone to death. Um, you could burn someone alive. Um, what other ways can you think of? Mm -hmm. As far as like, like lure them into a trap, I guess. So what do you mean? What? Like you know, like have somebody waiting like around the corner and like you know, I even sure. Uh, oh. They're in a coma. Sure. Um. So if I ask you that question on the test, Chris, are you going to have any issue with that? About you like, physically causing like going through every single one of those? Yeah, like that would be a way right. you could cause someone's disappearance. Okay, uh, no, I, I can definitely like I can pass. I mean, I think you could murder them, you could kidnap them, you could take them to another country, you could, you know, bury them in your backyard. You could, yeah. you could do a million things. Yeah. As far as um, trying to conceal them. Yeah. Right. So that no one can find them. Yes. Because at, at this point, she's gone. So when I ask you the question on the test, I'm not asking you about guilt. I'm not asking you about, did you make her feel so horrible that she ended up leaving? I'm saying that you were the one that physically caused her to disappear, okay. either by murder, kidnapping, you know, all of those other things okay. that we went through, okay? You want me to list, you want me to list all those? Like no, no, no. Oh, You're okay. just going to say no to that question. Okay. Right? When I ask you if you physically caused Shanann's disappearance, okay. your answer should be what? No. Right. So do you have any issues with that at all, and no. have any question about what I would mean when I was? No, that's, would be that's totally like I just like going through all those that. Um, <laughs> that's right. a lot to really think about. Right. Like but trying to figure out like, how, yeah, that was. I'm gonna have you take a bath and break. Thank We've you. been in here quite a while. So you're gonna be taking what's called a directed lie polygraph. So what that means is they're going to be test questions on the test where I want you to lie. I know it seems kind of weird, but you're going to know which questions these are and they're going to be easy to answer. They're all going to start with before 2018. The directed lie test has three types of questions. Known truth questions. These are easy questions to answer, such as, are you sitting down? Or, are you wearing shoes? They serve two purposes. The first purpose is to provide a baseline reading for when the subject is telling the truth and should elicit very little bodily responses. The second the second purpose is to disconnect the examinee's thought patterns between each question as a means for resetting their cerebration for a more accurate reading. Control questions. These are what the polygrapher just explained to Chris. Whenever she says, before 2018, at the start of a question, Chris will know he is purposely supposed to lie. Each of these questions are deliberately constructed that all answers will be responded with no. Relevant questions. These relate specifically to the crime being investigated, and the examinee will know that they are supposed to respond truthfully. A guilty subject will show a much stronger reaction to the relevant questions than to the control questions, even though they will be lying on both of them. This is due to the immediate threat posed by the relevant questions. So I'm going to say before 2018, did you ever lose your temper with someone you cared about? And you're going to say? No. Because you're telling a lie. Awesome. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Did you write the number one? No. Did you write the number three? No. Did you write the number five? No. This portion of the test is complete. Please remain still while I take the instrument out of operation. Okay, you can relax. How'd you feel? 
This is the last time the polygrapher will have any correspondence with Chris before the real test begins. She gives him an initial compliment in a reassuring tone. You did great. Yeah, that was... You remember to lie and everything. That was awesome. That was... <laughs> This momentary boost in his confidence is then abruptly ripped away as he receives the following information. So, <laughs> you obviously are a really bad liar. Have, have people told you that before? Like, the second you tell a lie, like, they can tell, like, on your face that... Because the second you lied to them, number three, like, I don't know if you heard me clicking, but I had to, like, turn down the sensitivity because you're starting to go off the page. So, that is what I need to see as a polygrapher because that tells me that you know it's wrong to tell a lie. Um, and you're actually having a significant reaction when you lie, so that is awesome. So thank you for being a proper okay, liar. I, I no, that's a good I'm... thing. That's a good thing. We don't want to be good liars, so thank you for being a horrible liar. Um, and that just shows me that, you know, obviously on the test when we're asking, you know, significant stuff about your wife, um, if you're lying to that, it's going to be even 10 times more amplified. So I oh, appreciate I that. Know. I appreciate that very much, more than you know. So that was awesome. And the coolest thing about this is right now, there's only one person in this room that knows what the truth is. And in about five minutes, there's going to be two of us. So that's the coolest part, okay? And then I can go share that with them out there, okay? Okay. All right, you ready? Let's do it. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Do you understand I will only ask you the questions we have discussed? Yes. Regarding Shanann's disappearance, do you intend to answer all of the questions truthfully? Yes. Is your first name Christopher? Yes. Before 2018, did you ever lose your temper with someone you cared about? No. Did you physically cause Shanann's disappearance? No. Were you born in 1985? Yes. Before 2018, did you ever say anything out of anger to a loved one? No. Are you lying about the last time you saw Shannon? No. Are you now in the state of Colorado? Yes. Before 2018, have you ever wanted to hurt someone to get even with them? No. Do you know where Shannon is now? No. This portion of the test is complete. Please remain still while I take the instrument out of operation. All right, how'd you feel? Same? Yeah. Part of it, didn't I? Yeah. So I brought Graham in here because we yeah. want to talk to you about the results, okay? Okay. So um, it is completely clear that you were not honest during the testing, and I think you already know that. Um, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. Okay. So now we need to talk about what actually happened. I feel like you're probably ready to do that. I didn't. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph. I promise. Chris, I, 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 I know. Chris, stop. It's time. I just I'm, stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. I, I want you to take a deep breath right now. 